Well, good morning. Just an extra minute there to make all, make sure all the batteries are fresh and ready to go, and I think we are ready to get our worship service started. Thank you for being here this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday morning in God's house. It's always a good Sunday morning in God's house. And uh, we're going to start with Blessed Be the Name. If you'll stand, this is a little medley of choruses, Blessed Be the Name and In the Name of the Lord, and one flows right into the other. And we'll get our singing voices warmed up with these this morning. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. There is strength in the name of the Lord. There is power. again. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. There is strength in the name of the Lord. There is power As we keep on going, that's some great singing this morning. Let's keep it going. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now. one is uh, one that maybe doesn't get sung as often as we should. Sometimes the first verse gets sung at the end of a service, or maybe just the pianist plays it as everybody exits, but it's a great, great hymn. Take the name of Jesus with you, and we're going to remind ourselves what a great hymn this is right now. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. Yeah. 
It's good to see you. Thank you. You may be seated. If you're joining us on YouTube, thank you for your viewing. If you're here with us in the congregation, thank you for being with us and choosing to worship with us. We so, so appreciate it. If this is your very first time with us here at First Baptist Church, or maybe a very long time since you've been here, would you do us a favor and you raise your hand high above your head like I have mine? We have a card we want to place in your hand. We've got some folks over here, some folks over there. That's awesome. Right over there, high above your head. These guys can't see if you don't put it up there. If you'll take that card, if you are technologically of the type that you can QR code and scan the QR code, it'll take you to a web page where you can fill out the information. All we need is your name and email address. If not, fill out the back. It asks for the exact same things. If you'll do that, we'd like to have a record of you being with us as well. Uh, we will communicate with you via email and uh, give you an opportunity because we would like to donate in your name, uh, or I'm sorry, in your honor, uh, $10 to a local charity. And so we think uh, that's uh, our way of saying thank you and giving back to the community. So we're glad that you're here with us. Let me challenge you to continue to pray for our juniors. They leave to go to camp in about two weeks. Our high schoolers go in about a week and, I'm sorry, a month and a half. So please be in prayer about that so very much. I love the words of that last song we sang where it says, Hope of Earth and joy of heaven. Wow, what a blessing those lyrics are, that we have what Titus says is a blessed hope. And so we're glad you're here with us this morning. Let's open our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you because you are our blessed hope and you are our joy of heaven. And this morning, God, as we come together as a congregation, uh, may we keep our eyes upon you be with Brother Barry, give him the clarity of thought, clarity of speech, and may he present the message that you've laid upon his heart. But then allow each of us to listen with open hearts and open minds. God, we love you. Thank you for an opportunity to serve you in this community. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. First one-third of my life, I lived in a town called Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo was the home of the Colorado State Hospital, which is the mental hospital there. And so Pueblo was made fun of by the rest of the state. They had things like rubber dub dub, rooty toot toot, you are the people from the Institute, P U E B L O, Pueblo, Pueblo, and I put up with that for 20 years. Not until today that I realized that Pueblo is a marvelous place to be from. Corey, come on up here. This is a missionary, and he's from Mississippi. And the town he's from makes Pueblo look high class. What's the name of your town? Buzzard Roost. You hear that? Buzzard Roost. I love Pueblo. That's great. Corey's a missionary. He's on his way to a couple of countries. And our missionary of the week, is, rather than being on video, we're going to let him talk to you and tell you what he's going to do. And he'll be back speaking for us this evening at 5 o'clock. Corey, glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all so much for having us. I can honestly say there's no place I'd rather be on this side of heaven than, than amongst God's people, just being able to sing and, and worship to them. Uh, once again, we are the Teague family. Uh, I have my wife with me, Brandy Teague. She's right over here. She's such a blessing to me. Lord's really uh, helped me a lot in my life through her. And then I, we have our daughter, Eleanor, and our son, Levi. Uh, she is five, he is three. And then we have Silas on the way, who is due about September 5th. So if you would please pray for us. Uh, you want me to give my testimony? Okay, uh, so I didn't grow up in church or anything at a young age, have very few memories of being in church. Um, uh, my mom was saved. Uh, she's gone on to be with the Lord now uh, back in the beginning of 2020. Uh, my dad is, is still not saved, if you would please pray for him. His name is Jimmy. But, but growing up like that, uh, really, if, if, if I didn't get the answer that I wanted from my mom, I could just go to my dad and, and really I could do whatever it was I wanted to. So I, I grew up that way most of my life, just which they were strict, but uh, but 
uh, didn't grow up in a Christian household is, is the reason I'm saying all that. Um, I can remember my mom reading me Bible stories at a young age, went to the occasional VBS, things like that. But uh, at the age of 12, I walked down an aisle, made a profession of faith, followed a man in prayer. Uh, and so he told me I was saved because of that prayer, but there was no knowledge of sin, repentance, anything like that. Uh, fast forward to my teenage years and um, didn't believe in the God of the Bible, started getting mixed up in the occult and, and uh, substance abuse and things like that. Uh, fast forward a little bit more to the time when I was 17, uh, began to believe in the God of the Bible, started trying to go to church, trying to pray, trying to read my Bible, things of that nature, putting a big emphasis on the word try because that's all I was doing. All I was doing was trying. I wasn't trusting in what Christ had done for me and uh, by shedding his blood for my sin on the cross. Um, and so lived that way until I was about 21, uh, going to church, trying to do what I thought was right, but, uh, but in, the, in the same hand, still living a sinful life doing just about whatever I wanted. Uh, and then when I was 21, uh, the Lord sent my cousin into my life, and, and, and he led me to the Lord. Uh, and then I really began to be able to serve him, and uh, he just started straightening up my life, sent us to a good Baptist church down there in Mississippi, uh, called me to preach in 2016, was saved in 2015, uh, called me to preach in 2016, and then in 2017, he called me into the ministry uh, as far as missions goes. And... Uh, having grown up the way that I did, not knowing anything about missions or anything like that, uh, whenever we sat in our church's first missions conference, um, right after we had joined it, it, it really kind of blew my hair back. But but I can remember a man by the name of Gary Crisp was preaching our missions conference, and he and he preached from Romans 10 about the Lord wanting more than just your money, how the Lord really wants your heart and your faithfulness. And, and the Lord spoke to me that night and, and, uh, and called me into foreign missions, and it seemed like each year after that, in, uh, in our annual missions conference, he narrowed it down more and more on, on what it was we would be doing. Uh, so if you would, please pray for us. I'll speak a little bit more of it afterwards. Uh, we have a display table set out back. Uh, normally, we get our kids to pass out prayer cards during, uh, at the beginning of service, but uh, we'll probably do that uh, in between services. So if you would, just please get a prayer card and please pray for us. And I just want to thank you all again for having us.
talk about me. I love talking about me. My wife and I have owned the same house in Ruskin for over two decades. It's a four-bedroom house with two living rooms, and there are two of us. And I'm tired of sleeping in a different room every night. <laughs> Our house is going to go on the market. We have purchased a house, a, a double wide in a senior adult mobile home park. I find people, I, I'm at Home, Dart, home Depot, I'm at Walmart, folks that don't even in church here are saying, I hear you're retiring. No, I'm moving in the retirement park. I hear you're moving. Yeah, I'm moving across the water. We're going to go on the other side of the Little Manatee River. We're not going far. I'm not retiring. I'm staying. So yeah, if you don't like that, I'm... So if you hear, it's true, our house is going to go up for sale because we don't need that big house. And it seems to be people think a house with water behind is worth a lot of money. So if someone wants to pay me twice what my house is worth, I'm going to let them. <laughs> so just those rumors are all, they're, they're just talk. They're fake news. It'll be on Facebook next week. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come here to worship you, to sing praises about you. You're certainly worthy of everything we've sung today. Your name is special. If we had a thousand tongues could sing your praises, it wouldn't be enough. You are powerful. Your name is indeed blessed. We are grateful to know you, thankful that you have allowed us to accept your son and the free gift of eternal life, that you have prepared a place for us in eternity where we will live with you. You are incredible in your love, in your care, and how you make us feel honored and special. We ask now, Lord, that you bless this offering. We, we just ask that you would bless the First Baptist Church. Bless our nation, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.
through the long dark nights out on the open sea by faith alone side unknown and yet his eyes were watching me the anchor holds though the ship is battered the anchor holds Though the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. visions I've had dreams I've even held them in my hand but I never knew they would slip As if they were only grains of sand The anchor holds Though the ship is battered The anchor holds Though the sails are torn I faced the raging sea, the anchor holds in spite of the storm. ship is battered the anchor holds though the sails are torn I have fallen on my knees as I faced the rain of 
the storm. We're studying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Our subject today is that the Lord is coming and the saints are leaving. It's going to be our subject for the next two or three Sundays. We've seen in Thessalonians that the Word of God and the teaching of the Lord's return is a saving truth and it stimulates us to serve. It stabilizes us to help us to stand fast in difficult times and it strengthens us. We've seen so far in chapter 4 our potential, our purity, our progress, our purpose, and today we've come to our prospect. Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ignorant means to not know. Concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, precede them, which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us as we study your word. We pray that what we learn today, next Sunday, and the week after about your return for us will strengthen us We pray that it helps us in the greatest fear of our lives, death. We ask for wisdom. We ask for grace. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to speak this morning from verse 13, 14, and 15 about those who are asleep. But as we begin, I'd like to pause for a sidebar on the wisdom of God by allowing Paul to be chased out of Thessalonica and Macedonia so soon. The story of him in Thessalonica is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 1 through verse 10, and it goes like this. Now when they had passed through Pilipus and Apollonia, I'm sorry, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Jews a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Three weeks. Three Sabbaths, he's there. So we'll call it a month. Maybe a couple of days before, and then right after that, this takes place, verse 5. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out unto the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying. By the way, Jason and the brethren have been believers for how long? Three weeks. At max, three weeks. And they are now going to be attacked. These that have turned the world... I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying... These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there are, is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, 
they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas, sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. Doesn't take Paul long to stir up trouble, does it? What's he doing to stir up the trouble? He's preaching about Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And he's doing so by taking the scriptures and showing people what the scriptures, the Old Testament, says. I don't know how long Paul would have liked to stay in Thessalonica, but I'm pretty certain it was longer than a month. If he had stayed longer, he would have been able to answer all the questions that the Thessalonian believers had in person as those questions arose. And if that would have happened, you and I would be poorer because there would have been no need to write the two letters, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, which we are now studying. So something good came out of something bad. He couldn't stay. He could still minister. Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. That applies to Paul and Silas and Timothy. But it also applies to you and I. Because what was bad for the Thessalonian church was good for the Ruskin church. Because we get to see what the Word of God says concerning the future. So Paul answered those, her questions in epistles. It's a fancy word for letters. They were carefully preserved, ultimately incorporated into the New Testament. So we have available to us the questions that the Thessalonians ask Paul about the Lord's return. The question seems to be, hey, Paul, what happens to those who put their faith in Christ but die before the Lord returns? Paul answered their question by speaking of three things. In verse 13, feelings. Verse 14, faith. Verse 15, future. So let's start in verse 13 with our feelings. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Death is indeed a hopeless tragedy for those who are outside of Christ. Death causes those who are affected by it to mourn and weep. We've all attended funerals. We stand before a casket, gaze into the cold, calm faith, face of the deceased, and we are forced to confront the terrible finality of death. At funerals, people ask questions and want answers. The philosopher comes. He expounds his theories and thoughts about death. He quotes from the sages of the past, none of whom can act as an authority as to the reason for death or speak as an authority as to what lies beyond, for none of them have left and come back. It's all opinions, all arguments, and we have no idea if the opinions and arguments of the philosophers have any validity to them at all. The scientist comes. He says, I'm sorry. I did my best. I trained your doctor. I equipped your hospitals. I've discovered new medicines which do amazing things, but I have failed to keep death from your house, from your home, from your loved one. And despite all of the science all the things that have been learned about cells and genes and chromosomes and DNA. Medicine does not stave off death, nor does medicine bring us back to life. The family comes. Here's a weeping wife. A broken husband. A son. A daughter. the man might cry out like David. Oh, my son, my son. Would God I had died for you, my son. There's not a man among us 
who would not take the pain and sickness of our family on ourselves, if we could, to keep them from suffering. Years ago, I had a barber. I don't even remember his name. I had an appointment, and I walked in for my appointment, and there was a ribbon across his barber chair, and I said, what's happened? His boss said, don't you read the newspapers? Haven't you heard the news? I said, I have no idea what happened. His house burned last night. He and his wife got outside and realized that their baby was inside. He went in and reached that baby, got the baby, and reached the baby outside the window to hand it to his wife and fell dead. Gave his life for his child. You would too. I would too. There are not many I would die for. But my wife, my child, yeah, I would. Wouldn't have to think about it. But even if I did think about it, it wouldn't change. I would. I'd give my life for them. For those who are outside Christ, death is final. It's cold, it's cruel, it's callous, utterly uncaring. Death is mean and menacing, and it is inescapable. And the Apostle Paul calls it our last enemy. When death comes for you, you can fight it, but you cannot win. You may stave it off a little while. It's coming back. The only consolation that we have is in the Word of God. In Christ, we have hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 acknowledges our sorrow while encouraging us. We have hope. We sorrow not as others which have no hope. Indeed, death for a believer is described as sleep. It's something we frequently crave and desperately need. If you do not have sleep in this life, your quality of life is very limited. And yet, we fear death. We welcome sleep. And yet the Lord says, for a believer, death is sleep. Death brings hardship and heartache and we do sorrow. Oh, how we miss those whom we love. But we have God's word on this subject. That our loved ones are simply asleep. It's a reference to the state of the body. The soul does not sleep, the body does. The body is temporal, the soul is eternal, it's made for eternity. And by the way, only humans have souls. Animals have bodies, they have spirits. Human beings have souls. And the soul never gets tired, it never gets old, it never gets ill, and it never sleeps. Death is when the spirit of a person leaves the body, and the body seems to go into a deep, uninterruptible sleep. In John chapter 11, first 15 verses, Jesus described Lazarus after his physical death as being asleep. Then he declared his intention of going to Bethany, where Lazarus had lived, to awaken him from death. John eleven eleven. our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Outside of divine revelation found in the Bible, there are no words to comfort us when death strikes. You will receive no comfort from an atheist. He'll say, there is no God. There is no heaven, there's no hell, there's no truth to Christianity. All he leaves you with is nothing and your heartache, and he makes it worse. Or you could trust God's word, which is the equivalent of trusting God. You can trust those whom the Holy Spirit inspired to write about death. And when we trust the Word of God, we learn that God is alive and that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun and that Christianity is true and it gives us a hope like none other. And each of us make, must make the choice as to who and what we, build, we will believe and you will not escape the consequences of that decision. 
In chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul is speaking under direct revelation and under divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Please take notice. The Holy Spirit did not try to rob the Thessalonians of their tears or of their sorrow. We should not pretend that death does not bring terrible loss and tears. We should not tell a grieving widow or an orphan child that it's wrong for them to cry in sorrow. We should cry with them. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. That's a strange thing. You know the best thing you can do for someone at a funeral who's crying? Cry. They'll look at you. You care? Yeah. I care about you. I care that you're hurting. I care that you've experienced a horrible loss. We are encouraged to weep, but not as others which have no hope. I have no idea how many funerals I have done in my life. I, I, I imagine it's over a thousand. I have watched as husbands and wives reach down and kiss their mate on their forehead. I love you. See you again. I have watched as those who do not know Christ try to reach into the casket and pull their dead loved one out. And I have watched as a funeral director in a panic saved a woman from the casket from falling on her as she cried inconsolably and uncontrollably that her daddy was gone and she'll never see him again. And the sad part was she was right. Outside of the word of God, there is no hope for us. Inside, there is great hope. James 4, 9 says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. It's how you minister to other people. Enter into their sorrow with them. But we do not sorrow as those which have no hope. Because we have faith, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Now, if he's going to bring them with him back, it means he knows where they are. And it also means we will see them again. The if here is not the if of doubt, it's the if of since. The hypothesis is assumed to be an actual fact. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. The first class, if extra, extra four if structures in the Greek. The first is, here it means since, because it assumes a certainty, not a contingency. The second class, if, is if it were so, but it is not, it, it assumes the contrary to the fact. The third class means if, it's more likely. And the fourth class means it's remote, but at least likely. This is number one, since. Chapter 4 and verse 14 is a qualifying condition. Paul is not casting doubt on the belief of the Thessalonians in the resurrection of Christ, he's taking it for granted. Since you believe. Then comes that great foundation of our faith and hope for eternity. It is based upon Jesus' death and resurrection. No fact of history is greater. When Paul stood before Agrippa and witnessed to Agrippa, trying to get Agrippa to accept Christ as Savior, which he came close. Paul, thou almost persuades me to be a Christian. Paul said, this thing was not done in a corner. Everybody knows about the resurrection of Christ. Might be the greatest attested to fact in all of history. 500 people at one time saw the risen Jesus Christ. 500. You know how many it takes in the law court to prove? One, two, three. 500. Not at separate times, at the same time. Paul himself had seen the risen Christ. And here's something amazing. Although those disciples, all 11 of them, 
who saw the risen Christ, died martyrs' deaths, except for John. He was actually martyred a long time. If you knew something was a lie, would you die for it? I read a story about Watergate recently. Chuck Colson was one of the Watergate men. He said they had 11 men that all tried to keep a secret. He said the secret died in about three weeks. Because as soon as the pressure gets on, they all start turning on each other. And yet all of the disciples went to their deaths, refusing to recant that Jesus Christ is alive. Having indicated the parallel between Christ's resurrection, now past, and our resurrection, now pending, Paul says, speaks about them who sleep in Jesus. Some authors render the phrase, them that are put to sleep by Jesus will God bring with him. Now, that's kind of interesting phrasing, isn't it? Put to sleep by Jesus. When you die, you will die with Jesus Christ by your side. It kind of reminds of what happens when we have little children in our home. We give them a bath, tell them a good night story, listen to their childlike prayers. We tuck them in the bed. We kiss them good night. We turn out the light. Nothing is strange or scary about that. We put them to sleep lovingly. We protect them when they're asleep. Here's the parallel for the Christian. Dying is not to be feared any more than sleeping is to be feared if you're a believer. COVID was a horrible thing that happened to our nation, happened to the world. There were some positive things about COVID. Here's one on the spiritual side. COVID taught you how strong or weak your faith is. If you're scared to death of dying, it means your faith is weak and you need to work on it. You're more afraid of COVID than you are faithful in Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm trying to get a hold of you and shake you. Your fear is greater than your faith? Don't you believe that when you die, you go to be with Jesus? Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'm better off with him than here. Do you believe the Bible? Because the shameful thing is that all across our nation and all across the world, there are hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior who were scared out of their faith. Right. Well, you think if you die with COVID, you don't go to heaven? No believer ever dives alone. We sleep in Jesus. And when he returns, he will bring us with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When the time comes to die, you will die safe in the arms of your Savior. And you will welcome death as you welcome sleep. Verse 15 speaks of our future. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. This teaching was brand new when Paul gave it. He calls it the word of the Lord. It's absolutely reliable. Verse 18 tells us that these words are to be used for comfort for ourselves and for others. It is remarkable how much faith we put in words. You know, when we learn, it, we begin learning as little children with words. Spoken words. Teachers tell us things and we believe it. As we get older, we learn things that are beyond us. I remember the first time that I heard the physical thing that E equals MC squared. I think that was some genius named Albert Einstein came up with that. Must be true. I mean, I may not have the slightest concept of what it means, Einstein's equation gave birth to the nuclear age. By the way, what it means, E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. That helped you, didn't it? Got it! We are told that a large dose of arsenic is fatal. We believe it. 
better believe it. Not many people want to put it to the test. Many of the things that we say we know, we've simply accepted by faith. We've taken someone's word on it. Faith is not the mark of foolishness. As a matter of fact, a lack of faith is often the mark of foolishness. The Apostle John says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If you've ever believed a human being that told you anything at all, you should believe God because he's a lot more honest and he has a lot more integrity than any human being you have ever met. He has more knowledge. He has more wisdom than anyone you will ever meet. He has more integrity and character than any human being. It is impossible for him to lie. Have you ever heard words coming out of your mouth and as you spoke them thought to yourself, well, that wasn't true. I have. I, I've had to correct myself mid-sentence. The Apostle Paul says, God cannot lie. In Titus 1, 2. Have you ever accepted a lifetime guarantee? In the company to go out of business? You know how good your lifetime guarantee is? It's good as long as the guy who guaranteed it is around. Well, God is eternal and he'll always be around and his word is good and he's honest we have a guarantee backed up by the word of God which says the dead in Christ shall rise first so if you die before the Lord comes back you get to go first is that a consolation prize 1 Corinthians 15 the Apostle Paul declares that the resurrection of Jesus Christ unconditionally guarantees the resurrection of the Christian. The truth of the rapture is confirmed to us by the resurrection of Christ. He's the first fruits. He's the one that guarantees it's all going to happen. His resurrection demonstrates that our resurrection is not only entirely possible, but absolutely certain. It is confirmed to us by the reliability of the one who made the promise. There is not a slightest shadow of doubt. God's promise must come true or God has lied and God cannot lie. David Livingston, African missionary, 19th century, used to say about the Lord's promise. It is the word of a gentleman of the stricted and most sacred honor. And that's the end of it. A promise from Jesus Christ is good. You don't need to take it to the bank because you're going to take it to heaven. And that promise will take you to heaven if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have believed in him. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. He gave you an opportunity to have his promise. And all he asks of you is to trust him. Well, Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone here today who does not have the hope of eternal life. I pray for those here today who have the hope of eternal life and have received the promises of the Word of God and have stumbled and struggled and their faith has faltered. Help us to get back to the place of faith in our Savior. Help us to not be foolish, but help us to understand that in your will, we will one day die, and when we die, we will do so in your time and in your care. 
Lord, I thank you for loving me enough to send your son to die on the cross for me. And I thank you for loving me enough to allow me to hear the gospel and for encouraging me to accept the gospel. And I thank you for the hope that you have put in my heart, hope that's found detailed in the word of God concerning my home in heaven for eternity. I pray others have that same hope. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for one verse. We're going to join Robert on the second. Would you speak to the Lord? Ask him to speak to your heart. Draw you close. Robert's going to sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. And bids me at my Father's throne Make all my wants and wishes known In seasons of distress and grief My soul has all often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour To make an announcement about the um, who's true directories and, and of her. I hate to have you follow her engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his word and trust his grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer thank you very much would you be seated for just a moment we have an announcement I got a couple number one I called the missionary Corey. His name is Cody. So you have my permission to call me Ramsey. How's that? <laughs> and now we've got an announcement while she's getting that microphone. Deacons and trustees meeting this afternoon at 345. Same place as normal, but 345, that's a little bit earlier than normal. We've got a lot of things to take care of. Mrs. Weatherholt, you're on. I've got an announcement to make. And I know you're probably going to not believe it, but our 2022 pictorial directory has finally arrived. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord here. Praise the Lord. And I got to tell you something. Some of you people look really good. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, we have them in the back. If you had your picture taken either by their photographers or by one of our church staff, then your directory is free. All you have to do is go out and claim it. However, if you said, I don't want to have my picture taken, but I want one of those directories, then you have to pay for it because we had to pay for it. We were given free directories for everyone that had their picture taken, but we had to pay $10 for all those extras. So if either you didn't have your picture taken because you didn't want to, or you 
just want to have an extra one because you forget where you put the other one, then you can pay $10. If you are new and have come since we had our pictures taken in January, it is free. We want you to know, and you're going to love this directory because you're going to look at it and you're going to go, is that who that is? You're going to finally be able to put names and faces together. So if you need a directory, come on to the back. You can pick them up. They'll be available for several services now. We're just really looking forward to finally getting to put names and faces together. So there'll be a couple of us out at the back ready to give you your directory or ready if you don't have, if you weren't here, for get yours done. If you want to buy one, that's fine. But we're excited, and you did look really, really good. Some of you look so good, I'm not even sure I know who you are, but uh, they're good, we're excited, and we'll meet you at the back table. Cody and his family, if they would make their way to the back, that way people can greet them at their table. And I understand that Miss Diane is willing to autograph and sign any of your directory. So she'll be in the back as well. And if you want her signature, no extra charge. All right. Let's all stand together and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for, for everything that was accomplished in your house today from the morning Bible studies to the worship uh, of uh, singing and also the preaching of your word. We thank you for our pastor and we thank you for the message. May our hearts and minds be open to it. I pray that uh, we would uh, let these things uh, sink uh, in our heart, thinking about uh, death and uh, your return. I pray if there's anybody who isn't sure that they would grab a hold of one of the staff and uh, come to them and uh, ask them about heaven. We pray no one would leave. Uh, leave this place without having that blessed assurance of heaven. I pray that we would live with uh, you in mind and uh, live, live here on earth, but for eternity. Help us to be your servants. As we leave from here, we pr pray that you dismiss us with your blessings, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.